Mm, yeah, hello guys. Mm. Chat is closed. Okay, could you please turn on the chat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, should be fixed now. Um, yeah, so hello everyone. Um, today we are continuing the advanced solidity topics. It is actually the last lecture of advanced solidity today. Um, yeah, it will be quite complex and uh, quite hard to understand. So yeah, if you have any questions, just interrupt me and ask. Um, on the next lectures, we will like cover tokens and et cetera, et cetera. But today is like a low level one, which is uh, really essential and um, yeah, but those uh, concepts have to be known so you could understand how everything works in, in the low level. Um, like, yeah, so let's start. Uh, first of all, uh, let's start with precompiles. Um, what are precompiles in uh, Ethereum? Um, Precompiles are special smart contracts that come native, uh, like natively with Ethereum. They're built on top of EVM to extend its uh, functionality. Currently, there are nine precompiled contracts available, and uh, all of them live on special addresses, uh, which right now start from address one to address nine. Uh, right now, there are uh, only nine precompiles, but uh, Probably in the upcoming fork, which is CanCon fork, uh, there will be more precompiled uh, pre contracts added to Ethereum. But uh, yeah, I, I won't uh, explain how they work right now. We will concentrate on those nine uh, that are available right now. So, um, as I mentioned, there are nine of them. And let's go one by one through each of them and understand what they do. Uh, the first one, uh, pretty much the one that is used uh, the uh, the most, it is called uh, EC Recover or App Recover, uh, which lives on address one, and uh, it implements the ECDSA recovery algorithm. So basically, it is used to understand uh, who has signed the message, given the message, and the signature. Um, it, if everything is correct, the EC recover precompile uh, returns the signer address. Uh, then uh, there is a precompile contract uh, which implements the SHA-256 hash function. It is available on address two. And basically how it works is it accepts uh, arbitrary data in, in the call data form, uh, hashes it, and returns uh, the hash of this call data, which is 32 uh, byte hash. Also in uh, Ethereum, there is one more hash function available, which is ripen, uh, ripend. Uh, 160 available on address three. Uh, also works in the same way as uh, SHA-256 precompile, but uses a different hash function. Uh, and that's pretty much all the difference. Also, uh, there is a like, pretty unique uh, precompile contract. Uh, its name is identity and it is available on address four. Um, what it does is it actually returns whatever is sent to it. So you can um, send arbitrary uh, data there and it will return this same arbitrary data. Uh, usually it is used to reallocate memory or to copy big chunks of memory and et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, uh, 
the precompiled that uh, purely uh, mathematical. It is uh, mod exp uh, precompile available at address five. Basically, it calculates uh, this equation. It is some base um, uh, to the power of exponent uh, modular L with arbitrary precision. So basically, you can send um, the like numbers of uh, arbitrary and bits, pretty much any numbers you want. It can be uh, big numbers. It can be like numbers that are way more than 32 uh, bytes long. And this precompile will calculate um, uh, this expression. Uh, then uh, there are three precompiles that uh, work with el elliptic curves. They are uh, they are all like pretty much connected. Uh, these are uh, EC add, EC mal, and EC pairing uh, available at address six, seven, and eight. Uh, those precompiles all work on on the same elliptic curve. Uh, it has this name and uh, basically, each of those precompiles uh, implements either addition or multiplication or pairing. <clears throat> so basically, essential elliptic curve operations. Um, and uh, the last but uh, not the least uh, precompile available right now is uh, Blake to F precompile available at address nine. And uh, basically it realizes a special function that is used in Blake2 uh, hashing algorithm. Um, so you could uh, use this hashing algorithm on chain. Um, yeah, uh, let me just... Uh, about uh, the upcoming fork. So there will be one more to compile available uh, that is essential for um, the data sharing. The precompile will uh, realize the uh, polynomial commitment verification and it will be probably available on address well. And also in the upcoming fork, uh, so this is not completely settled. So the discussion is still going, but probably um, they will add four more precompiles that work on a bit different elliptic curve, but also realize EC add, uh, EC mal, and EC uh, pairing with additional uh, precompiles that work with that new uh, elliptic curve. Yeah, so this was a bit off topic. Um, but let's uh, define what properties uh, those precompiles follow. So the first one and the pre pretty much most essential one is that precompile contracts never revert. They either return zero or nothing. So leave the return data empty if an error occurs. <clears throat> So which errors might occur? Uh, the first one is, for example, if you input uh, something wrong that the contract doesn't understand, or for example, you run out of gas. And in that case, uh, either zero or nothing is returned. Uh, why it is essential? Uh, because in high-level solidity code, you will have to manually check that uh, the precompile returned zero or nothing so to reverse the execution of your transaction. Uh, the second property is that opcodes that read uh, uh, contracts code or size of the code or hash of, of the code so here is the example is uh, external code size. 
and my similar opcodes to that treat precompiles as externally owned accounts. So what I mean uh, by that is even though precompiled contracts are contracts, those opcodes do not detect any bytecode there. So the Xcode size will return zero, even though there is like an, an abstract uh, bytecode that EVM executes. And the third property is that precompiles work with call data. And even though the accepted format differs from ABI encoding, which is like used throughout the uh, Ethereum ecosystem, it is still possible to call those precompiles this way. Uh, also, precompiles don't have storage, they only work with call data and return data. Um, yeah, so speaking of um, the ability to call those um, precompiled contracts through ABI interface, is this unlock challenge. Uh, so let's just go quickly through the code and then like on top three this solution written. Um, so we have a contract with a function unlock, which accepts some address. Uh, this address is sort of magical. Uh, why? Because in, in the function body, we have three requires. The first one is that the size of the code has to be a zero. So uh, checking uh, that requirement means that uh, the contract, uh, the, the address is not a contract. Also, we have a uh, uh, check that this magic address is not the message sender in case uh, there was a constructor trick to trick the first requirement. And also, there is a third requirement is that if we cast this address to ERC20 token, and call balance off function for providing message sender, it has to return um, something which is more than zero. And if those requirements pass, we send message sender um, the whole Ethereum balance of this vault contract. Um, so what is controversial here, uh, that's we require for the magic contract not to be a contract, but also we are calling a function on that contract. So this is a controversial a bit. So how does that work and how to solve this, uh, this puzzle? The solution to this puzzle is um, to provide either of those two precompile contracts. So uh, if you remember, those two implement uh, hashing algorithms. So address two is a SHA-256 and address three is RACMD 116. Uh, this requirement passes because precompiled contracts do not have code. So VM returns uh, code length zero. And search requirement passes because Basically, what happens here is that we are constructing uh, a call through ABI. So we are defining function selector here. We are defining some parameters to, to this function. And under the hood, Solidity encodes the, uh, the function and parameters through ABI. And then forwards uh, this data to our hash function. And hash function takes this data, hashes it, and returns the hash of the data we passed. And because the return data is uh, of uh, hash function is 32 bytes long, uh, Solidity nicely converts it to number, which is uh, a part of balance of function. So return data uh, there has to be 
like more than zero uh, because it expects the number to be returned. And of course, uh, the hash of some arbitrary data will be more than zero. So that is why this requirement also passes and uh, this is the solution. Uh, yeah, so enough of precompiles. Let's jump to the uh, next uh, section of this lecture, which is um, digital signatures in Ethereum and some uh, standards that uh, are used throughout the, uh, the ecosystem and by many uh, decentralized applications. So first of all, uh, Ethereum users uh, mainly utilize two types of digital signatures. The first one is ECDSA and the second one is uh, BLS. ECDSA is used in the execution client to uh, sign transactions, sign messages, and also there is a precompile um, that is used to recover the, the message signer on chain. Also, the EC recovery used by nodes to understand who sent the transaction. Um, there are like two extensions to ECDSA which are defined in EAP uh, 1 and 1 and the EAP 712. So those uh, EAPs describe how to construct and send messages. So those messages are safe and uh, there are no like replay attacks. And also uh, there is new uh, digital signature, which is BLS. And it is used mainly in the consensus client to sign slot attestations. And uh, yeah, let me just quickly uh, explain what I mean here. So uh, when Ethereum switched from proof of work to proof of stake, um, every 32 blocks, uh, there is a period which is called an attestation period where every single validator that uh, state uh, as there to become one has to vote on certain blocks, whether they like this block or not. And this voting um, action is called an attestation. And uh, because there are like more than 500,000 validators in Ethereum, voting and uh, transmitting 500,000 signatures and like voting results is too much like to be done in 12 seconds between blocks. Uh, the network will be too congested for, for that. So the solution is to somehow aggregate those votes uh, and signatures. So that is why the BLS signature uh, was uh, used. Uh, yeah, because it is uh, like fairly easy to aggregate the signatures and you can have like one signature which is the same length as as the regular signature and uh, verifying it is not that complex. Um, for example, comparing to other aggregated signatures. And uh, BLS is used to optimize the network. And yeah, right now I think uh, those 500,000 validators are combined to like several hundred signatures, uh, which are then individually attested. Yeah, but uh, I won't cover um, Ethereum consensus. But what I will cover is the ECDSA and those two standards. So I just understand uh, why use message signatures in the first place. So I hope you remember that 
uh, the, the first case of signature usage is uh, when the user sends a transaction. So they sign this transaction to uh, like mark that this is actually them who sent the transaction. So we are not speaking about those. We are speaking about just arbitrary messages, signatures. Uh, so there are several use cases where it is useful to uh, just have an ability to sign arbitrary message and use it in the, in the application. So the first one is that those message signatures may be used by like trusted parties to approve some sort of action for users. Uh, this can be a regular ERC20 permit. If you, um, if you have ever used it, this can be um, like, for example, there is a bridge between two networks. And uh, when, so when you're locking funds in the one network, the bridge listens to uh, the locking event. And if everything is fine, the bridge will give you uh, an opportunity to withdraw funds on, on the other network. And the opportunity is basically the signature that allows you to call a smart contract. The smart contract will verify that the signature belongs to the bridge owner or, or like bridge signer and allow you to withdraw funds. So this is what I mean by approve some sort of action. Also, uh, message signatures might be used in a multi-sig. So instead of uh, sending a transaction to approve certain action on, on the multi-sig bullet, you can have a backend setup that uh, like tracks the signatures of users and users just sign um, like sign the, their choice, uh, either they uh, for or against like a certain uh, transaction. Also, this can be used in any DAO or whatever you want. Uh, also, um, really often you can find that some sorts of signatures are used to uh, like user is presented uh, some sort of like message to sign, which uh, then confirms that they have signed and like checked the terms and conditions of this platform. Um, also, the signatures may be uh, may be used to somehow initiate the interaction with the backend. So, for example, you can use the signature to set up your uh, GWT uh, token, so to speak, to, to the backend service. And uh, another option is to use signatures. So, if they are like cleverly constructed, you can use signatures as an entropy to some kind of uh, enc encryption key and generator. Uh, you can actually construct the signatures and keys in a way to, for example, store some encrypted data on chain. Uh, for example, you can use signatures to then feed the signature as an entropy to an uh, IS a key generator, and then encrypt whatever you want with this key. And like by some custom logic, uh, nobody will know what is like hidden and beneath this encryption. But only the user will know because they have a private key, so they can sign a message and get the signature to decrypt the data. Uh, okay, so let's then go through. Uh, the first example, uh, I will explain what this uh, EAP is about. 
So basically, uh, the AAP uh, describes that uh, in order to use messages uh, like signatures on chain, they uh, like the actual message that you are signing has to be like prepended with the prefix. And the prefix is uh, Ethereum signed message, then slash on, the length of the message, and the message itself. Um, because like the message here is the series to bytes one, I have hard coded series to into the prefix. Uh, why is it useful? Uh, because if we are not appending the prefix to uh, to the message we are signing, we can send users like arbitrary bytes, and this might mean that they will sign a transaction, and we will use the signature to steal money from them, which is like not good. So what we have in our example is the vault. Uh, we have an owner, uh, which is equal to the creator of this contract. We also have some nonce, which is equal to zero um, right now, and the function unlock. So the function unlock, it accepts uh, three signature parameters, R, S, and uh, V and uh, constructs the message on chain. So I use the ABI encoding here to take the current nonce, the message sender, and I then take the hash of, of those two values. So this will be our message. And then I append the prefix to this message and hash once again, because this is how AP191 um, once, like, wants me to sign the message or to construct the message. And then I pass uh, this uh, Ethereum signed message to the AC recover algorithm. And uh, like I'm trying to recover it and check who has signed it. And if the signee is an owner, then I am confident that the owner allowed message sender to withdraw funds from this vault. I am also uh, using nuts here to mitigate some sort of replay attacks uh, and not allow this message sender to withdraw funds twice. Because the, uh, if the nuts is different, then the message is different, then the recovery won't work. So it will return something else, but not the address of the owner. Um, but with the uh, AP191, there are several problems. It is too simple, and there are replay attack uh, attacks possibilities. Replay attacks of cross-chain kind, of cross-contract kind, and of cross-function kind. So let's just go one by one through them. What I mean by cross-chain kind is that if we have the same contract deployed on a different chain, we have the same owner set, and we have the same nonce, allowing user to withdraw funds from one chain will also allow uh, them to withdraw funds from another chain. Why? Because we never check for the chain ID of the network. So basically, because the keys on either chains are identical, the signatures are also identical. Uh, the cross-contract co uh, replay attack is if we have the same contract but deployed on the same network and with the same owner, with the same nonce, so allowing on the one contract also allow on the another contract, which is not good. And the cross-function uh, signature replay is, for example, if we had another function that used uh, the same like method to get the message, uh, it might like happen that 
using and allowing the user to call one function would also allow calling another function, which is also uh, not what we expect from, from our contract. Um, actually, how those signatures are constructed, they're basically constructed off chain. Uh, this only like verifies the message. So some like service or front end or like something will construct the message in the same way it is constructed in a smart contract. Then call a special method on the wallet of the user and like ask the wallet to sign the message. The wallet will sign the message and will return usually the concatenation of those three parameters, but it is fairly easy to like decode the concatenation because we know the lines. Yeah, so AP191 uh, has several weaknesses. Um, and if you are using this standard, you have to consider them. But <clears throat> those weaknesses are mitigated in AP712, which is a bit like harder to understand, but yeah, we'll go through them. So basically, this AP defines a method to uh, construct the message which the user will send in a special way, so to completely mitigate uh, the replay attacks. So uh, the actual uh, EAP works in the following way. Uh, we have a special type hash, which will be appended to every message we are constructing. So the type hash uh, consists of uh, several parameters. The name of the contract, the version of the contract, the chain ID of the network, uh, and the refined contract, which will, uh, like it, it is the contract that uh, will verify the message. Uh, it is just the hash of the string. And also, uh, try, like I follow the standard, and the standard uh, says that we have to use the vice search to. Uh, like uh, type uh, to uh, like for, for, for our name and for our version. So that's why I am hashing those. So I've got the name uh, and the version hashes of the construct. And here I build my domain separator by ABI encoding the type hash. It is our identifier. You can think of it as like a function ABI encoding, but a bit extended one, because in the function ABI encoding, we won't have the names of the parameters. And also the types are like mismatched. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm encoding. So basically, like concatenating with certain rules the type hash, the name, version, the chain ID, which is a number, and the address of this contract. So basically, I am following the parameters which are listed here. And uh, this is called the domain separator. So if we append this domain separator to the whatever message we are trying to construct, it will define the chain ID, so it will anchor the chain ID and the verifying contract. So those two fields basically mitigate any cross-chain or any cross-contract uh, signature replay attacks. But what about um, cross-function signature replay attacks? So here we have the same function unlock. Um, and also I have to build a unique domain separator for this unlock function. This is what the standard 
wants me to do. So also I define uh, the main separator here. I name it unlock, just like the function name uh, with a capital letter. Um, specify address and nuts. Then I construct the uh, hash or like separator of, of this function, which works the same way uh, how I constructed the domain separator above. So I'm using ABI encoding, passing here our uh, like signature in quotes, also passing the message sender here and nuts, and instantly incrementing the nuts after it is passed to, to this function. Uh, then I have obtained this hash, and I have to con concatenate uh, this hash with uh, the domain separator, which I built in the constructor. So here I'm using the uh, encode packed encoding, which is uh, like straight concatenation of bytes, and appending the special prefix, which uh, the standard requires uh, to append the domain separator and the struct hash, and also hashing it once again. And this will be the message that user signs, or in our case, the order signs. So then I am passing this message to the EC recovery algorithm and checking um, if actually the owner signed it. If everything is okay, then uh, I am forwarding uh, all other from this contract to the message center. Uh, so to recap, uh, we constructed a special domain separator, which separated the chain and the contract from the rest, also the name and the version. We can like change the version in the future and, for example, upgrade. Um, so if you are using upgradable contracts, we can change the version in the future and uh, use like a different um, separator, which will also provide the cross version uh, replay attack mitigation. And then I appended the like the domain of the function which uh, the owner allowed me to call. Uh, yeah, why are we incrementing nuns? Uh, nuns is an essential part of every signature, and nuns means uh, like actually it means nonsense. But why am I incrementing it here so to uh, mitigate the replay of the same signature? So because the owner has given uh, the message sender like an approval to withdraw funds, this approval only works if the nonce is correct. So for example, the nonce right now is one and the owner said that with nonce one, this sender can withdraw funds. So the sender withdraws funds and the nonce instantly becomes two. So if this same sender comes to this message, uh, the nonce will be two and the signature will be invalid. So I hope this is clear. Uh, this is like a simplified version of um, like how signatures might be used. Because of course there is a race condition here, and which is um, if owner gives the permission to two users, then only one of them will be able to uh, call this function. And actually, like nonces have to be used like uniquely for every user. But yeah, here it is just a sake of the example. So and the nonce is global. But this basically means a race condition, which is like not really good.
Okay, so can we answer the question? Was it clear? Okay, uh, so to uh, recap, which like standard, which standard uh, is like considered the best? Yeah. So <laughs> uh, the rule of thumb is to always consider using AP seven twelve over AP one nine one because uh, using AP seven twelve. Like it won't allow you to do certain uh, things that uh, one uh, nine one would, and uh, using seven twelve means that there will probably be less like unobvious bugs in the contract, even though the uh, standard is a bit more complex. Um, also, I never use the AP one nine one if it is a message that users have to sign. So if you're presenting a message to the end user, for example, in your front end, this message has to be uh, and must be built using the AP712 standard, because otherwise it is not safe for the users to sign them. Um, but like if you have your own like trusted backend and you are like fine with uh, whatever this backend is doing, you can use those signatures. Um, there is like no problem with that. Um, yeah, the main role of AP one nine one is to distinguish between messages and transaction signatures. So. If user like somehow uh, signs like arbitrary data, the wallet won't allow uh, this user to sign like raw bytes of the transaction. And this is built into many wallets. So MetaMask and Web3 won't allow you to sign just raw bytes uh, with the uh, signature methods. Um, what is AP712 designed for is to completely mitigate signature replay attacks. And uh, it is um, the standard that is used in permit functions, which are, which are right now like really uh, widely spread. Um, but yeah, AP712 is a bit more expensive to use because there are many hashes to um, to calculate. There are a lot of like concatenation of strings and bytes to do, uh, which might like increase the uh, gas, um, gas consumption of the transaction a bit. Uh, and also this standard is uh, pretty cumbersome to work with. So especially when you're writing tests, so writing tests, that cover AP712 signatures is not easy at all. But yeah, it is worth it. So the users that use your application are safe. Okay. And the last topic of uh, today's lecture is the bytecode. Um, so uh, from one of the previous lectures, I've already like defined what the difference between init code and runtime uh, code is. But uh, yeah, I will repeat it for uh, today's topic. So in uh, Solidity, there are two types of bytecode. The first one is init code, and it is the bytecode of the construct, which is like uh, produced directly after the compilation of the contract. And also, uh, usually the init code referred to the actual like data field when you are deploying the contract. And this data field uh, has, uh, so if your contract has a constructor that accepts anything, then 
the arguments of this constructor will be appended to the end of, of your bytecode. And there is a constraint that the init code can be more than 48 kilobytes. Uh, the runtime code is the contract bytecode after init constructor execution. Uh, so how, uh, how does it work? Is basically uh, when the constructor is run, it like executes arbitrary stuff. And in the end, it has to return the actual runtime code and put it in the return data. So it will copy some chunks of uh, bytecode, which, which was present in the init code when, when you uh, pass this init code into the data field. It will read those chunks of bytecode, uh, place them into memory, and then use the opcode return to read this memory and return the uh, runtime code, and place it into return data. <clears throat> and this runtime code can be more than uh, 24 kilobytes. Otherwise, um, Ethereum won't like deploy your contract. Uh, so here, um, I have an example of a pretty simple contract, and I will try to like break down the, its bytecode so you could understand what is going on on like the deepest level of EVM. Um, what you have here is we have a constructor in our contract which accepts the value which subsequently sets to, to a storage variable. Uh, so, yeah, then we have a function, which is external function that just reads this value and returns it. The actual value is internal, so there is no um, like uh, automatic uh, getter for it. We have only one function and a constructor. So after completion, I actually <coughs> use um, compiler three. Yeah. I actually use the compiler uh, zero point eight point nine uh, for for this example, but you will have a chance to check it yourself. And also, I uh, set the optimizer to two hundred runs, which is default, and the Solidity compiler, and when I deploy the contract, uh, yeah, so Solidity compiler returned this bytecode. And also, when I deploy the contract, I set the value of this variable to one. And here is what I got in the data field of the transaction that deployed the contract. So uh, here is the breakdown of, of the bytecode. Uh, so let's just slowly go through what's going on here. So the bytecode consists of several chunks. Uh, the first chunk, uh, actually the probably the biggest one in our example, is the constructor chunk. The constructor chunk starts from uh, a special like construction here that basically sets a free memory pointer. So you can read this as the opcode, then uh, through like a special website or like decompiler, understand what this opcode does and if it accepts any arguments or not. And et cetera, et cetera. So what this does is that oops, is that uh, this one 16 is a push of code. And push of code accepts one parameter that will be placed on stack. And this one parameter is this 81. 
So uh, right now we have um, 80 on stack. Then we have push of code once again, which accepts one parameter, 40, and pushes it on stack. So we have 40, 80 on stack. And then we have 52. 52 is M store of code. And M store of code accepts two parameters. It takes parameters from stack. And it takes our 40 and our 80 from stack. And what it does is it places 18 into the slot, uh, into the memory slot 40. And this basically means is that this construction initializes the free memory pointer. Uh, if you remember from previous lectures, free memory pointer lives at address 40 and its value uh, is equal like in the first uh, execution steps to 80. So this construction basically initializes the pointer. Uh, then we have a uh, construction that I like won't go in, into the uh, opcode level, but basically what it does is that it checks that our constructor is non-payable. So if you remember from our example, the constructor is indeed non-payable. So and this means that uh, there shouldn't be a possibility to deploy this contract where the value defined. So Solidity like, kindly injects this check uh, for us. And uh, those several codes just check that the uh, message value is equal to zero. Otherwise, there is a revert. So if everything is fine, uh, the execution continues, and there is a constructor body here. It is pretty large. Actually, uh, like when I uh, analyzed the bytecode, I like honestly didn't figure out why there are so many bytes here. And uh, like those bytes might be just used in a some like not obvious way, which is really hard to track. But what basically this constructor body does is that it uh, like exec uh, DVM executes the bytecode like one by one, byte by byte, and there is an opcode that reads the constructor arguments from the end. Here they are. Uh, there is an, an opcode um, code copy, and through this opcode, uh, EVM copies the constructor arguments, places them into memory, and then loads them from memory uh, to stack. Or, yeah, so you may optimize it by lots whatever. Uh, as you remember, we have one constructor argument here, and we are uh, assigning the storage value value uh, to be equal to our argument. So this basically happens in this uh, code. Um, there is an opcode uh, 55, I believe, somewhere, probably here. And this opcode 55 uh, is an S store opcode, and it writes the value to storage. Uh, it accepts the storage slot to read into and the storage value uh, to uh, write into the slot. So here we have 60, which is push opcode, which pushes a zero on stack, and then a store opcode that reads this uh, slot number. And somewhere here we have. Uh, value which is pushed to the stack to write into the slot. Uh, 
then like after that we have some bytes which I don't actually get why why there are so many of them but probably these are some checks uh, that uh, our Solidity compiler does which might be like essential for the safe uh, deployment of the quadrant. Uh, after the constructor body we have a tiny code section which uh, basically copies the runtime code into memory. Uh, basically, it uses the same code copy of code. It knows where the runtime code starts and copies this whole chunk actually with, with the metadata. And this whole, whole chunk of uh, bytecode uh, from the actual bytecode to memory. And after that, uh, there is a return upcode, FE, uh, if I remember correctly, which uh, basically reads the memory that the previous uh, opcodes allocated. And in, in, in this memory, we have uh, the bytecode, the runtime code, and uh, this return of code reads this memory with the bytecode and returns it by placing it into the return data. So here is our constructor. It uh, copied the constructor arguments, put them into the storage, copied the runtime code, and returned the runtime code uh, like from our transaction. Um, so when the smart contract will be called afterwards, this uh, section of code will be executed. So it also starts from the same um, like same of codes as our constructor did. It also locates the three memory pointer. And then there is a chunk of code that is responsible for so-called function dispatching. Uh, function dispatching basically means that um, there, there is a uh, like there are certain bytes, certain codes that EVM translates like one by one. And there are a lot of if else statements like placed in, into those bytes. So basically, uh, EVM will like decode the first four bytes of your call data and then check that those first four bytes by if else, if else, um, like compare to the function selector of the function you're trying to call. Uh, in our case, we have only one function and it will try to get the selector of what value function, this one. Also in that line, uh, Solidity compiler injected the check that if nothing matches, it will try to like match the fallback function. But because we don't have a fallback function, we have a reverse instead. If there was a public function, it would like go into the execution of that function instead. Um, when the solidity, oh, when the EVM uh, like got to, to the function selector that matched, uh, there are certain jumps that, that, that are encoded into, into the bytecode here. And those jumps uh, would like will uh, lead to this function body section. Uh, actually, if I remember correctly, 5b means the jump nest of code. And this is the place where the EVM execution continues uh, after the conditional jump or unconditional jump. Uh, if we already found our selector. And this is our uh, function body. What it does is it 
reads uh, the value from storage and uh, returns uh, this value from the function. So if e, uh, this is the return of code, if I remember correctly. And also, uh, it has to some like encode our return value. There are certain checks involved. And this is all happens here um, in the function body. Um, there might be cases where the actual function body and the uh, uh, function coding decoding are um, like taken apart. And usually those function uh, encoding decoding is named as function wrappers. So there might be some wrapping that, that is going on like somewhere here. And also uh, there is an important section which Solidity compiler automatically um, appends to the bytecode of every smart contract. It is the metadata uh, hash or section. So it consists of the like identifier of the metadata hash. It can be either IPFS or some uh, like other arbitrary decentralized storage uh, providers that, um, that will host or might host the smart contract source code. Uh, here we have an I IPFS identifier. Um, it is basically um, ASCII symbols mm -hmm. of uh, IPFS letters. Um, and after that, we have the actual IPFS hash, where the smart contract source code will be placed if you wanted to upload it into IPFS. Uh, after the IPFS hash, we have the uh, compiler version encoded. And after the compiler version, we have uh, two bytes um, that indicate the length of the metadata uh, meta section. Um, yeah. And after that, if we had any constructor arguments, they are as well appended to the byte code. But in the runtime code, there will be none constructor arguments available, but still there will be metadata hash. Actually, uh, what is like cool is, for example, if your contract is a factory contract and it deploys other contracts, the metadata of other contracts has to be like included into the real contract, like into the factory contract as well. So uh, you may like check any factory contracts and you will see that there are several metadata sections available because yeah, the one for the factory contract and the one for the um, contract that is deployed. Yep. Okay, so this is it for today. Um, it was the last advanced lecture. So the next time I will talk about tokens, ERC20 uh, tokens, NFTs, like how they work and what like problems they have and what kind of attacks are possible with those tokens. Okay, here. any questions?
Uh, yeah, actually, you will receive the practical task tomorrow. Um, yeah, today there won't be one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, if uh, guys uh, have no questions, our meeting for today. And yep. uh, see you next week. Uh, have a nice evening. Bye. Yeah, bye.